Now it's time for Toker Talk Radio, the voice of the marijuana nation. What are you people? On dope? Where you can tow. I am here. Uh, or you can talk. I experimented with marijuana and didn't inhale. Or you can talk and talk. Ten federal criminal penalties for possession of up to one ounce of marijuana. While we talk about toke on Toker Talk Radio. So, by the way, when it comes to pot, you know, if you're 40 years old, you live in a log cabin in Oregon, you got 12 giant pot plants in your backyard, have a ball. Live from beautiful Poplin, Oregon, at Rolla J Studios. Freedom, Plus your calls freedom, live at 971-533-7111. They're walking on their pants with their cap on backwards, listening to the end of a man, the Snoopy Snoopy poop dog. What's to keep somebody from getting all potted up on weed and then getting behind the wheel? Gateway theory doesn't work. It's a reality. Holland, is it real? Don't tease me. We're locking up people that take a couple of puffs of marijuana, and, and the, the next thing you know, they got 10 years. And now, here's your host, the guru of Gonta Graphics, the sultan of Sativa Statistics, and the worst nightmare of a reefer mad prohibitionist. A polite, perspicacious, productive pothead with a propensity for PowerPoint. Radical Russ Belleville. <laughs> I know that one was Frogger. Yes, Frogger, I win. I don't know what I win. I love Frogger. Welcome to Toker Talk Radio. I'm Radical Russ. That's Brian the Red. Some days. Later on in the show, we're going to give away this High Times magazine from 1975 in our trivia contest. Stay tuned for that. But right now, we got a special report coming in via our flux capacitor and our 1920s radio reporter. Stupid. Prohibition Story! As a public service, the Russ Belleville Show reminds you that smoking marijuana does not make one stupid. However, some stupid people do smoke marijuana, and Prohibition is always waiting for another victim. Learn your lesson from today's Stupid Prohibition Stories. With your Stupid Prohibition Stories, I'm old-timey 1920s radio reporter Freddie Farrakh. This just in from CBS Philly. New Jersey man accused of selling Rice Krispies as pot. Lakehurst, New Jersey. It was a case of snap, crackle, and pot. A police say a New Jersey man mixed Rice Krispies and oregano and sold it as... Marijuana to a 17-year-old for $210. Lakehurst Police Sergeant Ron Heinzman tells the Asbury Park Press the teen told her mother she had taken the money to pay for a half an ounce of marijuana. Police were called when the mother and girl confronted 22-year-old Richard Irving on Wednesday. Irving is charged with distribution of imitation marijuana. The girl is charged with a drug offense. I'm Freddie Farrakh with your stupid... Prohibition! Story! Uh, Alright, so let's let's break this okay, down, wait, man. Wait, wait, first, raise your hand if you've ever been sold bunk shit. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, so... Alright, so... But not bunk brownies, or... The, se- the 17-year-old girl <laughs> is gonna buy a half ounce for 210 bucks. That's the first thing, right? Well, where is this? New Jersey. Well, that's... That's probably what it costs, right? It costs, yeah. 210 bucks for a half an ounce. And then goes... Now, if it was a half ounce bag of oregano, I can see where... But this was Rice Krispies and oregano, like a Rice Krispie treat. It's like... There's something missing in this (laughs) story. There's something missing in this story. There's some testimony we need to find Let's see what we got in Asbury Park Press. Perhaps there's more uh, information information there. A $210 for a baggie that contained Rice Krispies and oregano. Um, yeah. Okay. And uh, admitted that she went to go get a half ounce and gave him $210. Uh, after leaving the residence, the juvenile discovered the bag contained Rice Krispies and oregano. <laughs> uh, 
The guy admitted he put Rice Krispies and oregano in the bag and attempted to pass it off as marijuana. Now, folks, I don't know if you know this. That's against the law. Yeah, selling fake drugs is just as bad an offense as selling yeah. real drugs. Yeah. Didn't you know? You can get busted for that. <laughs> yeah, you can get busted the same. The same stupid charges apply. You know, if you get busted, you get busted. Yeah. I think that the charge should be more if you get busted selling fake shit. There should be a because fraud charge on top of it. You, uh, yeah, there you go. Oh, yep, that's a, you know, misrepresentation of product. That's a, <laughs> you go. know, fraudulent advertising, you know, and uh, swindling. And swindling. Such. Yes. And general douchebaggery. Yeah, indeed. Do, 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 do. All right, so we are are going to take a break but when we come back i've got some more stories for you including video from kansas uh kansas city where a woman went to colorado and got a terrible surprise when she came back unfortunately we've also got uh nancy grace i played in the first hour that nancy grace clip of her debating herself on marijuana uh we're going to follow that up with politifact which has examined her claims about marijuana and determine them to be mostly false. No kidding. Really? And then we'll also have a story on why legalizing weed will not fix Mexico. It's important, I think, you know, as we debate marijuana legalization to not put too much emphasis on how much it's going to affect the cartels. We'll tell you why toward the end of the hour. And our giveaway trivia contest coming up next. You can win this first year anniversary issue of High Times from 1975. The Russ Belleville Show is blogging and podcasting daily at RadicalRuss.com. The law offices of Omar Figueroa would like to remind you to stand up for your rights. Please do not give up your precious liberties. There's nothing wrong with standing up for our constitutional rights, and in fact, it's the best way to honor the Constitution that recognizes our natural rights. Treat law enforcement with respect and respect the Constitution by standing up for your rights. If you are detained or arrested, stand up for your rights by repeating, I respectfully invoke all of my legal and constitutional rights. I do not consent to any search and seizure. I want to remain silent, and I want to speak with my attorney, Omar Figueroa. Omar Figueroa has more than a decade of experience in federal and California courts and graduated from Yale University, Stanford Law School, and Trial Lawyers College. Please contact the law offices of Omar Figueroa at 415-489-0420 or 707-829-0215 or on the web at omarfigueroa.com. You can get 420 Radio on the go with our Shoutcast stream for all internet-enabled media players. Go to rad-r.us slash 420shout or just click the Shoutcast icon below the live radio feed at 420radio.org. Cannabis Outreach Collective is an alternative health and wellness option located in Gladstone, Oregon that serves patients in the Portland area and beyond. We are a full-service alternative health and wellness collective accommodating patients with natural, organic, holistic, and homeopathic remedies, nutritional guidance, advice, education, and medical cannabis fully in accordance with Oregon OMMP law. You can find out more about Cannabis Outreach Collective on Facebook at COC503 or by emailing Cannabis Outreach Collective 503 at gmail.com or by telephone at 503 853 1319. Check out our menu on Weed Maps and visit Cannabis Outreach Collective today. So y'all feeling good? Yeah. Welcome back, everybody. Nine after the hour. Coming to you live from beautiful Potland, Oregon, here at Rolla J Studios. You're listening to Toker Talk Radio on 420radio.org. We got Brian the Red hanging out here with us. And we are just chilling. But it is Friday, and Friday is the day that we like to celebrate our fans with Fan Friday Trivia. That's right, it's time for Fan Friday Trivia. You can win this 1975 copy of High Times Magazine. Ooh. And on the back, it's got the Cool It 
<laughs> Menthol Job Double Wide Cigarette Papers ad. Love that. Also in this uh, 1975, it's the first anniversary issue of High Times. So this is their first anniversary. Uh, it uh, features an Eskimo lady there smoking a joint because Alaska goes legal. We've got all sorts of interesting stuff. It's just like a time. It's like time traveling when you read this stuff. Uh, an ad for a Quaalude paperweight. Very, very cool. Mm-hmm. Can't get Quaaludes anymore, people. Uh, a thing of the past. A bong mask, uh, a joint roller ad. Uh, to me, the ads are some of the, yeah, yeah. the best he- part. Hemostats, you know. Hemostats. For, for, you know, roach clips, basically. The pot kit knife. Yeah, that's hilarious. <laughs> but there's an interview here with uh, Andrew Weil, uh, who's still a very prominent uh, uh, physician and, and author. You can check him out. Uh, Travel Toke. Uh, all of the news that's still on the uh, bulk, uh, like, newspaper print, because they didn't print the whole thing on Glossy. The uh, North to Alaska, the golden age of cocaine wine. Yeah. Information on cocaine wine there. So this is some really cool stuff. And we will give this hash away. Hash oil article, too. Uh, yeah, yeah, article on hash oil. Yeah, uh, Lebanese royal oil. Yeah, it's all nice and red. I remember that stuff. Katmandu before. hash dens, right? So you can win this copy of High Times. We give these away through email, and you'll be emailing Russ at RadicalRuss.com. It's Russ at RadicalRuss.com. All I got to do is email in with the correct answer to the trivia question. And so today's trivia question is... What was the first state in the United States to ban marijuana, and what year did that happen? What was the first state in the United States to ban marijuana, and what year did that happen? Send your answers to Fan Friday Trivia. The email address is russ at radicalrust.com. And next Friday, we'll announce our winners. We randomly select from all of the correct answers, and you can win this one. Our first winner won a... Uh, was it March of 1975 issue? May? I think it was May 1975. And that was uh, Greg out of California. And we sent his out uh, this week. So you could win. Check that out. Very cool. All right. So now we're going to get to some video here. And it's pretty, pretty sad, shocking, you know, video that we're going to cover. And, and for some reason, I'm having some problems with that camera on Webcam Max. And every time I try to switch to it, uh, Webcam Max is dying on me. So just give me a second to... Restart that. We're doing it live. <laughs> so note to self, don't use that camera. Let's see if we can get the camera. There we go. So we're back. And let's see which camera I can get to work. Oh, we'll switch to the Toker Talk radio. See if we can pull up some video. Let's make this happen. This is a story coming to us out of Kansas City. Uh, and it it's uh, about a couple of women who traveled to Colorado to do a little pot tourism. And what happened to them from that point on? So here we go from, uh, this is from uh, KMBC in Kansas City. And tonight we're hearing from the sister of a Kansas City woman who died in jail. Now this started as a trip to Colorado, but it turned into a marijuana bust in, in western Kansas. KMBC 9's Matt Evans is live with the investigation. Matt? Well, 58-year-old Brenda Sewell died this morning in the Sherman County Jail, and her family that I just talked to tonight, extremely emotional and trying to search for answers to what exactly happened. Brenda Sewell and her sister Joy Biggs made the trip from Kansas City to Denver and back to give friends a ride after buying this RV. When coming back to Kansas City, the pair was pulled over in Sherman County, Kansas for speeding. Sewell had a host of medical problems, including thyroid, fibromyalgia, and hepatitis C. She had what her sister describes as a small amount of marijuana to help with the pain. The two were arrested, and the problems began almost right away. It took a long time to book us in. Um, it, it just took forever. They never gave us a phone call. We never got to get a hold of anybody. Nobody knew where we were at. It, it was just bad from the beginning. Jailers at first wouldn't give Sewell her medication because they couldn't identify it. She got sick and was taken to the hospital Tuesday morning, but problems persisted and continued to worsen. All of a sudden, she started foaming in the mouth and getting cold, and they still wouldn't come in. I kept telling them to please open the door and come in. 
but they wouldn't. They just watched through the window, just kept watching and watching. And so the other cellmate helped me lay her on the floor, and I did CPR on her. And then finally somebody came in, but it was too late. Sewell's family and friends described her as a very kind-hearted person that would do anything for anybody, and they say a lot of people in this world will miss her. Also, the Goodland Police Department is investigating her death as long as the can as as well as the Kansas Bureau of Investigation. Reporting live tonight, Matt Evans, KBC 9 News. The family is continuing to push for more information about what happened to Sewell while she was in custody, and we will keep following this story for you. This is why I get so upset when people like Kevin Sabet say, you know, well, nobody's in jail for marijuana possession. We don't, we don't imprison anyone for marijuana possession. Yeah, because that's total bull crap. This kind of stuff is why we're sitting here and fighting, you know, because what you don't realize, you just to choose not to, to acknowledge. You just want to ignore that people's lives are being destroyed because a plant is illegal. You know, just, and the poor lady, she's got just, fibromyalgia. Yeah. She's got all these different pain conditions. And I'm, you know, I'm willing to wager that part of the reason she made the trip across Kansas. I don't know if you've driven across Kansas. It's something you don't do unless you have to. Yeah. <laughs> it really sucks. It's a hell of a drive. But she drove all the way across Kansas to get into Colorado to, to, to go experience marijuana. And it's my bet that this that her experience is not going to be that different from a lot of people's experience who have been living with pain, who have been living uh, with whatever conditions, seizures, whatever it might be, and who've heard of medical marijuana, but they live in Kansas or they live in Wyoming or they live in Nebraska. And so now that it's legal in Colorado, they can actually try it. They can actually go there. Don't have to sign up for a card. Don't have to do all that rigmarole. They but can they actually just drive into the state yeah, they spend and try it. Days driving to get to this place to find, you know, something and try it, you know, just, we got a call coming in here from 541 area code. You're on the air with Toker Talk Radio. Hey, guys. It's uh, Kansas Justice. How are you doing? Doing well, man. I, uh, I'm from Kansas, and uh, I'm from about a two hours east of there, of Goodland. And um, mentality is insane. They, it's almost, it's, 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 if you smoke weed, they're coming out. I moved to Oregon, and I've since sort of came out as being a, a smoking to people and it's just insane the reaction that you get and they're I'm embar I'm embarrassed by that I mean that's truly disgusting yeah and I have they all and I've been I've been witness to other not not that not that um, serious but you know some, some serious stuff where um, people judge and um, actions that I've heard seen people beat up really bad i've seen you know from people who don't smoke <laughs> mm -hmm. that's the worst thing you know and it's crazy and it's, it's disgusting and it makes me angry yeah and this lady's so, getting stopped you know just over the border on the western side of kansas mm -hmm. and you know the cops there have got to be they're profiling waiting. anybody who's coming in from colorado without a state place they're, wa they're waiting that uh, you know uh, to me the cops in kansas they were they wanted colorado to legalize because they wanted and could not wait to start arresting people for, you know, people like this, innocent people like this. Because, of you know, they get more funding to do this than they do to actually do real shit. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. It's so, true. And yeah. uh, it's just sad, and I'm glad you were able to escape Kansas. Yeah, me too, brother. <laughs> you guys have a good one. All right. Thanks for calling Later. in, Justice. Appreciate that very much. Yeah, the... This is just, uh, and this happens in a lot of cases that aren't even marijuana involved, where the cops, the jailers, will ignore the medical conditions of people. They're trained to believe that people are faking it, that people are just trying to get away with something. And, and maybe that happens, but I'd say more often than not, especially in a case where we're talking about a nonviolent, non-criminal offender, Somebody's yeah. just possessing weed. And how old was she? Like in her 60s or something? Uh, I don't remember. I don't recall what the age was, but I think she was over 40. But yeah, so, you know, very little risk of her, you know, actually doing any damage or escaping. But they chose to just, you know, yeah. stand back. Yeah, it's pretty disgusting. Uh, yet another death 
uh, in the war on drugs. Uh, and another person who, despite what the drug warriors tell you, ended up in a jail cell because of simple marijuana possession. All right, let's let's think about better things and maybe get a little celebration on here. It's 420 here in the Pacific Time Zone. We have got ourselves a little bit of lemon sour, 18% THC. Let's check it out. Oh, have you ever met that funny reefer man? A reefer man. Have you ever met that funny reefer man? A reefer man. If he said he swam to China, he would sell you South Carolina. Then you know you're talking to that reefer man. When you are starting up a medical cannabis business, you don't just want any attorney. You want a fired up lawyer who understands the needs of cannabis consumers. The Law Office of Lauren Vasquez is your fired up lawyer for the cannabis industry. Lauren Vasquez knows the details of California marijuana law from both a personal and professional angle. Lauren Vasquez rose from the ranks of college normal activist to become one of the Bay Area's best marijuana lawyers. Visit her website, firedupmoyer.com, or call 1-855-MMJ-LAWS for more information. That's 855-665-5297 for Lauren Vasquez, your Fired Up Lawyer, or email firedupmoyer at gmail.com. The number again is 855-MMJ-LAWS, 855-665-5297 for your Fired Up Lawyer, Lauren Vasquez. Lauren Vasquez is an activist attorney you can trust. Call today. I'm Sub Cool from Team Green Avenger. At TGAgenetics.com, we are working on the leading edge of medical strains. Our strains are rigorously tested for THC, CBD, THCV, and other critical cannabinoids. Know your grow. Check out our genetic diversity at TGAgenetics.com. The home of Jelly Bean, Jack the Ripper, Vortex, and other award-winning cannabis strains. The Jody Emery Show with Jody Emery from Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, every Friday at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern, 1 a.m. GMT, right here on 420radio.org. That's Cass Haley here on 420radio.org. Love, love that music. Showing off some buds with a little magnifier. People are saying, hey, get yourself a desk camera. We will. Red Eye says he's got something. Look at that fix. I want to show more macro photography on the show. Yeah, we'll get, we'll get some better close-up bud porn for you. Yeah, there we go. All right, so PolitiFact took a look at some of Nancy Grace's claims about marijuana. Uh, Norm uh, Kent was actually on our show again last night, but it was all about Justin Bieber's arrest, right? He got the DUI where he Bieber. was drinking and uh, admitted to smoking pot. And so, of course, Nancy had to go off on, you know, Justin Bieber, he's smoking pot and drag racing his Lamborghini. You know, I think that they were uh, they were targeting Bieber because of when they got into his house to get that footage from the surveillance cameras about the egging of his neighbor's house. Uh, they found other drugs, but they couldn't bust them on him. Because they weren't in there for looking for drugs, they, they were in there the looking yeah. for footage, you know, evidence of uh, something else. But then I bet they kept their eye on him since they knew that he was rolling. You know, you know, I think uh, this has a whole lot more to do with Justin Bieber than marijuana. <laughs> right? I think he's oh, just leave a tool. the Bieb alone. He's just a tool. That's what it is. He but is she tried to tie it. <laughs> she tried to tie it all to marijuana and how awful he was because of marijuana. So I'm gonna reshow. That uh, video I showed in the hour one, Nancy Grace debating herself on marijuana. Because when it was Trayvon Martin, you know, marijuana just turns you into a slacker loser. But now that it's uh, legal, it makes you kill your family. So check this out, yeah, and then yeah. I'll cover the uh, PolitiFact story. The judge allows in evidence that... Trayvon Martin did have marijuana in his system 
at the time he died. What difference, if any, does that make? It's because I've seen too many felonies, and I don't mean pot sales or growing pot like this guy up in Connecticut. To me, it means that he is less likely to pick a fight with someone. I mean, people on pot shoot each other. Isn't it true that when you smoke pot, you just want to lay on the sofa and eat? People on pot kill families, wipe out a whole family. The common uh, connotation pot goes with lethargy, with uh, the munchies, with wanting to eat, with being laid back, not with chasing somebody down, jumping out from behind bushes, beating them in the head till, till they're pulpy, and, and, and basically starting mortal combat. That's not what you typically equate with smoking a doobie. I've got to be drinking booze, or I've got to be smoking, or I've got to be high on... Yeah, all right, so there's your Nancy Grace arguing against herself. And so uh, PolitiFact took this up. Now, PolitiFact is the uh, political watchdog group that evaluates the claims that they hear on cable news shows and you know runs them against fact and science, reason and logic, and tries to tell you whether or not they're true. They're supposedly nonpartisan. There have been some complaints about them, but uh, generally they're relied on as being a nonpartisan source for this. So Nancy Grace's quote, this is the quote that they're going to challenge here from PolitiFact. Her quote is, People on pot shoot each other, stab each other, strangle each other, drive under the influence, and kill families, end quote. And that's for <laughs> that's from her January 14th appearance uh, when uh, she had Mason Tavert on the show. Yeah. Okay. So here's part of what she, here's the, uh, the whole quote, actually. The reason I'm against legalization of pot is that I've seen too many felonies, and I don't mean pot sales or growing pot. I mean people on pot that shoot each other, that stab each other, strangle each other, drive under the influence, kill families, wipe out a whole family, end quote. So PolitiFact, of course, started asking people. And they found the consensus among drug and psychiatry experts, marijuana alone does not propel one to commit acts of violence. Most users are not lighting up and heading over to Fight Club. They want to wind down, not amp up. <laughs> and they talked to Dr. Ison Salome, a professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences, who is also the chief of the Division of Substance and Alcohol Abuse at the University of Miami's Miller School of Medicine. And he said, quote, Clearly, the majority of users don't become aggressive, Definitely, in terms of clinical work, violence is not the first thing that comes to mind when people are dealing with marijuana, end quote. Other psychologists and psychiatrists essentially agreed with Solon. Matthew Johnson, an associate professor of psychiatry at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, said, quote, Other than people driving under the influence, there's no scientific basis for what she's saying, end quote. <laughs> Uh, and remarking about the driving under the influence, Johnson said, quote, the effect is often not as dramatic as driving under the influence of alcohol. Usually people who drive while high drive slower, and the impairment is usually noticed when the driver's attention is divided, akin to the effect of some prescription medicines. Another doctor they talked to. Uh, Dr. Scott Teitelbaum, who's a professor and vice chairman of the University of Florida's Department of Psychiatry and the chief of the Division of Addiction Medicine said, quote, violence is not typically associated with the use of marijuana unless the victim is a chocolate chip cookie, end quote. <laughs> <laughs> and PolitiFact rated her claim mostly false. All right, let's go to our phone lines. Mostly. we got a call coming in from the 816 area code. You're on the air with Toker Talk Radio. Hi, guys. How you doing tonight? Doing fantastic. What's up? Hey, that's a nice looking bud. Thank you, man. Hey, um, look, I don't. I'm not trying to make uh, hay about uh, any death. Look, the death of that lady. I live in Missouri. The death of that lady. Um, that kind of thing doesn't happen in third world countries. I mean, there needs to be an absolute investigation into this. And um, these kind of going ons like this. This is horrendous. And. I just want to urge um, the people in Kansas, in Johnson County, which is the Kansas side of Kansas City, Missouri. I don't know what's going on in Kansas. I don't know if you do, Russ, know if there's any initiatives, but 
in Missouri, Show Me Cannabis with John Payne. We've got 13 initiatives introduced. The AG accepted them. We're pushing for 2014 in Missouri for legalization. I don't know what's going on with Kansas, but that whole corridor, and yes, that drive is boring. I mean, you would need some good bud just to make the drive. But, <laughs> but um, it, it's terrible. You know, I, I saw that in uh, the Kansas City Star this morning, and um, I myself am a victim of the drug war twice over, uh, pending right now even with the case. And this just has to quit, and I don't want it to be a down of show, but this is a huge news item, and this is, this is horrendous. So mm-hmm. I just want to emphasize yeah. that people in Kansas and Missouri really need to get behind the movement. I don't care. This time, get off the couch and do something. I personally am. I'm working with Shilling Cannabis and, um, and ready to go. But thank you guys, and thank you, Russ, for um, putting that up. I had not seen that clip from KNBC, so thank you for showing that. Yeah, you're welcome. And, um, that's about it. All right, man. Well, thank you for your call, Appreciate and thank uh, you thanks for uh, representing out there. Appreciate all the work you're doing. It's tough in a place like Kansas to get involved and put your name out there because you can face severe retribution. We talked to that last caller who talked about, you know, getting beat up just because you stand for legalization. Mm -hmm. So, but the caller is right. This is stuff that we shouldn't be even tolerated in a third world country, much less the United States of America. But we keep hearing the story over and over again where someone gets busted especially someone who's a medical marijuana patient and they're denied their medicine and they die. We got Richard Floor up in, in uh, Montana. We had, uh, um, uh, oh gosh, what's his name out there in DC? Oh, I forget the name, unfortunately, but too many people, uh, Jonathan Magby, that's the name, uh, who die because they get p- picked up for a marijuana possession. And while they're in the cell, you know, and, and, and a lot of people don't have the money to just bail themselves out. So they end up in jail overnight or over a weekend And these are a lot of times medical marijuana patients and people who have severe disabilities who, when they don't get the medicine they need, they die in a cell that they're being held in over pot. And let's not forget Daniel, was it Daniel Chong, I think the kid's name was, who was held by the DEA in San Diego for four or five days with no food or water. Mm -hmm. They just forgot about him. Yeah, had to drink his own urine. He was yeah. hallucinating. Yeah, he kid was, nearly died. Yeah, he try, you know, tried to kill himself finally by eating the glass from his glasses or something. Yeah, and it's ridiculous. It's bulk, you know. But here, uh, there are still people who, beyond all common sense and beyond all reason and logic, continue to support this prohibition, and they and they feel like they're doing it for the right reasons. I think it's important that we remember. The people who continue to support the prohibition of marijuana don't do so because, ah, ha, 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 we're locking up potheads. I mean, maybe some do, but generally the people that support prohibition feel that unleashing legal marijuana is going to cause all sorts of heartache and, and hellfire and, and terrible things are going to happen. Let me give you an example here. In this PolitiFact story, they got a hold of Calvina Fay. She's the head of the Drug Free America Foundation, right? Calvina Fay is right up there with uh, Kevin Sabet and Paul Chabot and all these guys. I remember her. <clears throat> She's one of the few that people can actually get a statement out of anymore. But she <laughs> says, she, she when they asked her about Nancy Grace's uh, you know, hyperbole about marijuana users shooting and stabbing and killing and ruining families, uh, Calvina Fay sent back links for... Uh, cases that had shootings, like a marijuana theft. And so there was a shooting and a marijuana theft. Shootings at grow houses, shootings at co-ops, um, and clips of marijuana use from the gunmen uh, of the most recent notorious uh, sh- uh, shooter sprees. You know, like Jared Loeffner and, you know, the, the, the uh, who was the kid that did, Adam Lanza, who did yeah. Sandy Hook and all that. And they point to these guys, oh, they smoked pot, and then they shot up schools. See, marijuana causes this, right? Yeah, to check the records, they were on pharmaceuticals, too. Yeah, that's the thing. Now, Calvina Fay says in her statement, quote, in many cases of violence, such as with Benjamin Bishop, Jared Loeffner, James Holmes, and the Pentagon shooter, these gunmen actively were or previously had been marijuana users, end quote. She also points to the 2012 study on the brain development, you know, that kids will lose the IQ points, right? 
But when they asked a Johns Hopkins, the Johns Hopkins professor about that, that's the, uh, what was his name, Jones? Johnson, Matthew Johnson. They asked Johnson about this, and he says the research is controversial because it's tough to eliminate marijuana use from all other factors that make people willing to engage in behavior that isn't socially acceptable. You know, like being on SSRIs, like being poor, like there's a lot of factors. And he goes on to say, quote, but even if that were true, we're talking about a small minority. It's not a question for the large majority of the public, end quote. So he's saying even, even if Calvina Fay's worst nightmares about pot creating school shooters is true, there's so few of them that they're clearly a mass minority of the 26 million people that smoke marijuana every year. So um, the National Bureau of Economic Research found surprisingly few studies that have tried to nail down a direct link between marijuana use and crime. After reviewing uh, related academic studies and crunching arrest and crime data, the National Bureau of Economic Research determined people involved with violent crimes are also likely to use marijuana, but, quote, the marijuana use is not necessarily related to their decision to engage in crime, end quote. And finally, on the overlap of high-profile murderers who used cannabis, Professor Johnson said there is bound to be overlap between people accused of murder and those who use marijuana, given how popular it is. But the same could also be said for people who have blonde hair and commit murders. One is not the direct result of the other. So finally, PolitiFact rates the claims by Nancy Grace that people on pot shoot each other, stab each other, strangle each other, drive under the influence and kill families. They rate the claim as mostly false, as we all knew. All right, 36 after the hour, we're going to take ourselves a break because our nanogram limits are getting a little low. When we come back, I'm going to tell you why legalizing marijuana will not end the Mexican cartels and won't fix Mexico. But that doesn't matter anyway. We'll be right back. We'll be right back after these messages from our 420 friendly sponsors. Support these advertisers because their ad money goes straight to the Russ Belleville Show. You're tuned into the Russ Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. Smoke Shop and Speakeasy is your source for cannabis community gear in southern Wisconsin. Owners Brian and Tammy Wood are located in Kendall, just outside of Madison, and they've got everything for the smoking enthusiast, including a full assortment of pipes, water pipes, hookahs, bubblers, one-hitters, and so much more. They're open noon to 8 p.m. Monday through Saturday and can help you with your detoxification therapies as well. Call 608-466-7473 or email woodpipes at yahoo.com for more information. That's 608-466-7473 or email woodpipes at yahoo.com. And as always, Go Pack Go! Support the Russ Belleville Show. Text the word Russ to 420-420 and connect with the National Cannabis Coalition. You can also send 10 bucks to the Russ Belleville Show right from your smartphone. That's Russ to 420-420. You're listening to Radical Russ on the Russ Belleville Show. You can get 420 Radio on the go with the TuneIn Radio app for all mobile platforms. Go to rad-r.us slash 420 TuneIn or just click the TuneIn Radio icon below the live radio feed on 420radio.org. Georgia, 
Hi, this is Willie Nelson. Alcohol prohibition didn't work in the 1920s, and marijuana prohibition isn't working today. It's time we stopped arresting responsible marijuana smokers. It's the fair thing to do. For more information, contact Normal, the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. Call toll-free 888-67-NORML or visit their website at norml.org. Sorry for the delay. I just was responding to an email from my 3.45 p.m. interview guest. <laughs> what? You didn't hear an interview at 3.45 p.m.? Yeah. Yeah, that's my fault. I completely forgot. Mm. And this person is not happy. <laughs> so, my apologies. That's I'm usually pretty good at remembering this stuff. Just messed this one up. Unfortunately, sometimes things happen. And... Now I just... Rest I just mind gets slipped. I just completely forgot, and I should not have. 
uh, but I did. But so my apologies, and uh, we'll try to get that guest back on uh, if he's willing to be uh, on again. <laughs> we shall see. All right, uh, let me get to the story that I'd hyped before uh, we went to break, and that is the subject of the Mexican cartels. You know, part of our legalization uh, rhetoric has focused a bit on taking the business away from the Mexican cartels and pointing out that, you know, legalization, according to the RAND uh, survey, they say that 15 to 26 percent of the Mexican cartels business is related to marijuana. So there's an interesting article uh, by Alejandro Hope in the Dallas Morning News, and it's entitled Why Legal Pot in the U.S. Won't Bring Real Peace to Mexico. And it addresses a couple uh, or a few of the points that we make and kind of points out that uh, these may be a little pie in the sky. So let me just run this down for you. Does the creeping legalization of marijuana in the United States spell doom for the Mexican drug cartels? Well, not quite. The illegal marijuana trade provides Mexican organized crime with about $1.5 to $2 billion a year, a third of their gross drug export revenue. Losing the marijuana trade would be a blow to their finances, but it certainly wouldn't put them out of business. So this is just a, a reflection of something I've pointed out in the uh, debunking of Kevin Sabet and, and, and Patrick Kennedy when they try to say, well, legalizing marijuana is not going to end the Mexican cartels. Absolutely right. It's not going to end the Mexican cartels. They will still exist. They'll still be committing crimes and dealing other drugs. The point is to emphasize that we're not trying to eliminate the Mexican cartels. We're trying to eliminate them from the marijuana trade. We're trying to say, why do we let Mexican cartels make $1.5 to $2 billion a year? Why do we allow that to happen? Why are we giving them that business when people in America would be more than happy to have that business? That's the point that needs to be made. He answers the uh, next question, wouldn't Mexico experience less violence if marijuana was legal? And we point out how there's, you know, tens of thousands of people that have been killed in Mexico over this drug war. But he points out that to some extent, yes, there would be a reduction in violence, but it wouldn't sufficiently alter this, the whole country's security outlook. The reason why is he points out that marijuana production and marijuana-related violence in Mexico are highly correlated geographically to five states in Mexico, Chihuahua, Durango, Sinaloa, Michoacan, and Guerrero. And those five Mexican states accounted for approximately a third of all the homicides in Mexico. So if we legalize marijuana and the murders go down in those five Mexican states, even if they went down by, say, half, then the illegal marijuana trade would bring Mexico's homicide rate down to 18 per 100,000. Right now it's 22 per 100,000. And it would still be four times the rate of murders in the United States. So yeah, it would bring the murder rate down, but Mexico's got a whole lot more problems to deal with before mar but, you know, marijuana's not going to take care of all of that murder. So the next question would be, well, wouldn't the Mexican government gain a peace dividend by redirecting some of the resources from marijuana prohibition to other law enforcement objectives, right? That's the old argument of, you know, cops aren't going to be wasting their time busting pot anymore. They can go bust real criminals. This author says, yes, but the effect would be relatively modest. Only 4% of all Mexican prison inmates are serving time exclusively for marijuana related crimes. And in 2012, drug offenses were less than 2% of all crime reports in Mexico. So yeah, it'll free up some resources, but marijuana doesn't make up the large bulk of what the Mexican police are having to deal with. You know, 4% here, 2 to 4%. The problem with Mexico, as this author points out, is institutional. The police forces, as they say, are underpaid, undertrained, undermotivated, and deeply vulnerable to corruption and intimidation. Its criminal justice system is painfully slow, notoriously inefficient, and deeply unfair. Even with almost universal impunity, prisons are overflowing and mostly ruled by the inmates themselves. So Mexico got much, much bigger problems. The marijuana trade, the drug trafficking, the violence... Prohibition does contribute to that, but there are still going to be plenty of institutional problems, plenty of corruption, plenty of drug trade, plenty of murders, even 
if all 50 states in America legalize marijuana. So as this uh, author concludes, and he's a former intelligence officer, uh, he concludes in the final analysis, Mexico doesn't have a drug problem, much less a marijuana problem. It has a state capacity problem. That is, its institutions are too weak to protect the life, liberty, and property of its citizens. Even if drug trafficking might very well decline in the future, in the absence of stronger institutions, something equally nefarious will replace it. So this is where we need to take a lesson here and understand that as we are lobbying for the legalization of marijuana and pointing out how the Mexican cartels interface with marijuana, to not pin our hopes on legalization in that it's going to save Mexico somehow. Mexico is not the problem that we are trying to solve. We are trying to solve the problem of marijuana markets being controlled by criminals, some of whom are Mexican cartels. Don't let the drug warriors steer you into this idea that legalization is going to solve all Mexico's problems because it is not. But do be sure to point out that the violent Mexican cartels are the ones running our market right now, and we can put them out of that business just by legalizing. All right, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we'll wrap up the show. One last story that... Uh, Brian the Red found. You remember those Doritos that the Seattle cops gave out at Hempfest? <laughs> the the one thousand bags for the twenty or two hundred thousand people. <laughs> yeah. Well, now there's a lawsuit about it. We'll tell you all about it when we come back. We'll be right back after these messages from our four twenty friendly sponsors. Support these advertisers because their ad money goes straight to the Russ Belleville Show. You're tuned into the Russ Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. Ever wonder how often to change your bong water? The most effective method for baking pot brownies? The best destinations for a ganja getaway. How to hide herb in your car. Whether to grow your own. How precisely to legalize it. Or how something as wonderful as marijuana ever got to be illegal in the first place. Finally, you can find all these answers and much more in the official High Times Pot Smokers Handbook, featuring 420 things to do when you're stoned. Since 1974, High Times Magazine has covered marijuana in all its aspects and wonders, from cultivation to legalization to the herbs enduring and exalted place in popular culture. Packed with inside information, the official High Times Pot Smokers Handbook rolls all of this collected wisdom together into a single indispensable ganja guide, including an entertaining look at marijuana's history, profiles of herb-friendly travel destinations and festivals, favorite potluck recipes from the High Times staff, smoking skills, advocacy and activism, essential marijuana movies and songs, profiles of famous cannabis strains, comprehensive growing information, celebrity endorsements, and much more. This is truly, finally, the ultimate guide to green living. Cannabis Common Sense with Paul Stanford and Casper Leach from Portland, Oregon. Every Monday at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. GMT, right here on 420radio.org. Marijuana and alcohol are the two most popular recreational drugs in America. Marijuana smoking is non-toxic, relatively safe, and has a low risk of dependence. Alcohol drinking is potentially fatal, dangerous to society, and is quite addictive. Marijuana is safer, so why are we driving people to drink? That's the question of the new book, Marijuana is Safer, So Why Are We Driving People to Drink? by Paul Armentano, Mason Tavert, and Steve Fox. Visit Amazon.com or ChelseaGreen.com today to order your copy of Marijuana is Safer or visit MarijuanaIsSafer.com. For an aeroplane I don't need a boat to float me away 
I don't need to grow wings and fly I'm gonna walk, walk to Jamaica I think it's time I need to disappear I've got to get myself away from here My travel plans are perfectly clear I'm gonna walk, walk to Jamaica that's our good friend Chief Greenbud with Walk to Jamaica. Check him out at chiefgreenbud.com. You can pick up his three albums full of great toker music. You want to check it out. All right, so um, we're talking about the Seattle situation here. <laughs> you remember those Doritos? Uh, the Seattle Police Department came up with a thousand bag of Doritos and they put a sticker on them that basically explained what the new I 502 legalization law was. But and it really didn't. It was just some goofy guidelines saying yeah know, don't drive don't, high you well know. Li- listen to pink floyd's album at the top you know level yeah, or yeah. something it's, it was it was pretty cute you know and they they had a thousand bags that they gave away at the seattle uh hemp fest and it was paid for uh by the seattle police department it came from their uh seattle police foundation and um this was uh headed up by sergeant sean whitcomb he organized the doritos giveaway right well now sergeant whitcomb is being sued Sergeant Whitcomb is being sued by another Seattle police officer who alleges that Sergeant Whitcomb created a hostile work environment after the officer declined to be part of the Doritos giveaway. The complaint said taking part in that event would have violated the officer's political ideology. Now, Seattle's special in this circumstance in that it's one of the few cities in America that has rules, laws against discrimination on the basis of political beliefs, right? You know, there's already, you know, you're protected. You can't be discriminated because of race or age or religion, color, you know, those kind of things. But Seattle also adds political beliefs. Can't be discriminated against if you're Democrat, Republican, uh, Libertarian, you know, whatever, a Whig, (laughs) whatever you might be, right? So this cop is trying to say that the police department was going to force him to give away these bags of Doritos that had the law on them, and that that would violate his political ideology. Now, I got a huge complaint about this. Seattle Police Department isn't commenting on it, and Sergeant Whitcomb's not uh, commenting on it, but I'm going to comment on it, and that's because I think this police officer is full of it. Yeah, He's trying to say that he doesn't like marijuana legalization, And so he doesn't want to give away these bags. This isn't a matter of being discriminated against because of your political ideology. Mm -hmm. And he is saying that uh, he was, you know, harassed and and given all sorts of crap because he wouldn't participate. I don't buy that either. I think this guy is just trying to have it so that he can complain about marijuana legalization. That's not a matter of, you know, if, 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 if this is allowed, if a cop is allowed to say, hey, well, I don't want to participate in this because it violates my political ideology, what other laws of the land yeah. might a cop decide violate his political ideology? Not shooting people? You know, abortion laws? <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, any law out there. It's not up for the cops to decide whether or not their political ideology yeah. allows them to follow the directives of they're the police department. To, they're there to enforce the law, not enforce their ideologies. Yeah. If they can't, you know, do their job, then they need to turn in their badge. Agreed. So this is uh, it's out on K U O W dot org. The uh, pl- the uh, public station out there in Seattle is talking about this. So if you want more information, that's where you can find it. And hey, folks, that's all the time we got here for hour two Toker Talk Radio. Thanks for joining us. Coming up next, the Jody Emery show. And then at 6 and 7, replays of the past two hours. At 8 o'clock, Herb Thrasher comes in here for two hours live of rock and metal. Plus an interview with Jake Orvis. Want to check that out. That's all the time we got. Thanks for giving us a wonderful week. Remember, next week we'll be on a reduced schedule, Monday and Tuesday. And then Wednesday I head down to the Oregon Medical Marijuana Business Conference. We'll bring you coverage from there on Thursday and Friday. For everyone here at 420 Radio, for Brian the Red, I'm Radical Russ. Thanks for joining us. And until next time, take care of each other, tokers. This is the Russ Belleville Show. The Russ Belleville Show is blogging and podcasting daily at RadicalRuss.com. You're going to
giant, you own it, you smoke it. You take a scene, you plan it, you grow it, you giant, you own it, you smoke it. You take a scene, you plan it, you